live in interesting times. Today's stories. Pro-independence protesters demonstrate in Barcelona. Chilean president celebrates ICJ's rejection of Bolivia's bid. Colombia's President Duque signs an anti-drug decree. U.S., Mexico, and Canada agree on a deal to replace NAFTA. Mexico's appointed foreign minister highlights financial certainty after the NAFTA deal. Plus, saving Hartley House. Hello, everyone. I am Jennifer Polentan, bringing you stories from around the globe. And this is Eagle News, Washington, D.C. A year after a banned referendum on secession from Spain, tens of thousands of Catalan militants piled pressure on the region's separatist government on Monday during an anniversary marked by road and railway line blockades. According to municipal police, 180,000 protesters gathered in Barcelona late in the day behind a banner reading October 1, no forgetting, no forgiving, to push for independence at a demonstration called by the Influential Civic Association, ANC. Around 500 people had already protested earlier on Monday, cutting main roads of the city and calling for the resignation of regional president Quim Tora, a staunch independent supporter whom they nonetheless accuse of failing to stand up for the Spanish state. Early in the day, several hundred members of a radical group called the Committees for the Defense of the Republic, or the CDRs, many covering their faces with scarves, had occupied high-speed railway tracks in the northeastern city of Girona, briefly blocking service between Figueres and Barcelona. Central streets in Barcelona and Leda were blocked, as was the AP7 motorway of South Barcelona and the A2 that links the city with Madrid, Catalan TV images had showed. Activists swarmed into Catalonia's regional government building in Garona and took down the Spanish flag that hangs out front, replacing it with a red, yellow, and blue separatist flag. The CDRs tweeted, quote, A year ago, we voted for independence. Let's act, unquote. Chilean President Sebastian Pinera and his ministers celebrate after the International Court of Justice rejected a bid by Bolivia to force the country to give access to the Pacific Ocean. His remarks were applauded by triumphant officials and political leaders who gathered at the presidential palace in Santiago to follow the reading of the 12 to 3 verdict by judges at the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Es un gran día para Chile, pero también es un gran día para el derecho internacional, para el respeto a los tratados internacionales y para la sana y pacífica convivencia entre los países. La demanda establecida por el gobierno de Bolivia, nunca tuvo ningún sustento, ningún fundamento, ni de carácter histórico, ni de carácter político, ni de carácter jurídico. Y por eso ha sido íntegra, total y categóricamente rechazada hoy día por la Corte Internacional de Justicia. El presidente Evo Morales de Bolivia, ha creado falsas expectativas a su propio pueblo y también ha creado grandes frustraciones a su propio pueblo. Y además nos ha hecho perder cinco valiosos años en las sanas y necesarias relaciones que debe tener Chile con todos los países vecinos, incluyendo por supuesto a Bolivia. La Paz took Santiago to The Hague in 2013 over its bid to regain access to the sea, a long-running strain on relations between the two South American countries. 
Bolivia lost its route to the sea in the 1879 to 1883 war with Chile, and Santiago has rejected every attempt since by its smaller and poorer neighbor to win it back. President Ivan Duque signs a decree to crack down on drugs in the world's biggest cocaine-producing country, Colombia. Nosotros como colombianos no nos podemos sentir ni cómodos, ni mucho menos complacientes, ni mucho menos tolerantes con una situación de aumento del consumo en las ciudades. No estoy de acuerdo con el decreto porque no resuelve el problema de fondo, el problema es el narcotráfico, quienes producen la droga y no quienes la consumen. El problema de Colombia es que como en el exterior están atacando al narcotráfico, entonces los productores de droga aquí en Colombia. Up next, US, Mexico and Canada agree on a deal to replace NAFTA. Mexico's appointed foreign minister highlights financial certainty after the NAFTA deal. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will return in a moment. Welcome back. You are watching Eagle News, Washington, D.C. The government's announced late Sunday night negotiators from Canada and the United States went down to the wire but were able to reach an agreement on a new free trade pact that will include Mexico. The United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, or the USMCA, updates and replaces the nearly 25-year-old North American Free Trade Agreement, or NAFTA, which President Donald Trump had labeled a disaster and promised to cancel. According to the statement from U.S. Trade Representative Robert Leitzer and Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland, the rewrite, quote, will result in freer markets, fairer trade, and robust economic growth in our region, unquote. Mexico's future foreign minister said on Monday, Mexican President-elect Andre Manuel López Obrador has given his blessing to the new U.S.-Canada-Mexico trade deal, as officials indicated it would be signed just before he takes office. Mexico's current economy minister, El Delfonso Guajardo, told TV network Televisa Mexico wants the deal. Known as USMCA, for United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, to be signed on November 29th at the G20 meeting in Buenos Aires, where the three countries' heads of state are all expected. That would be just before Lopez Obrador takes office on December 1st. The anti-establishment leftist had been critical in the past of the trade pact's predecessor, the North American Free Trade Agreement, and all three countries rushed to conclude the update before he came to power. But since winning the election on July 1st, López Obrador has been more pragmatic on Mexico's crucial trade relationship with the United States, the destination for more than 80% of Mexican exports. Marcelo Ebrard, López Obrador's pick for foreign minister, said the new deal reached on Sunday provides certainty to financial markets and supports investment and job creation in our country. He said López Obrador's key demand had been met, respect for the sovereignty of the Mexican state, particularly over its energy sector. 
As for the concessions made by outgoing President Enrique Peña Nieto's government, including stricter rules of origin on the amount of North American content required in the auto sector and the wages of those workers must earn, he said the new government would seek to offset the adaptation challenges with a new active industrial policy to strengthen the internal market. Lopez Obrador's transition team played an active part in the home stretch of the negotiations to update NAFTA, helping seal a U.S.-Mexican deal and then pushing for Canada to be kept inside as well. Peña Nieto, who is set to sign the deal along with U.S. President Donald Trump and Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, for his part hailed it as the achievement of what we proposed from the beginning, a win-win-win agreement. Guajardo, his economy minister, said negotiations had held firm in the face of Trump's threats to axe what the U.S. president called the worst deal ever signed. He said the Trump administration thought they could do and undo a lot of things without really understanding the benefits. They were thinking the unthinkable. Fortunately, that rhetoric diminished over time. Coming up, Saving Hartley House. Eagle News, Washington, D.C. will return shortly. This is Eagle News, Washington, D.C., and I am Jennifer Polentan. A community unites to save Hartley House, an institution that has been helping people in the neighborhood for over 100 years. Eagle News junior correspondent Noah Edrelin with the story. We're at Hartley House in New York to hear about a big announcement for the community. As most of you know, Hartley House, both the building and the organization, has been serving people in this neighborhood in all kinds of ways for over a century. Last year, however, our board faced the heartbreaking fact that our organization could no longer afford to remain in our home. The time and expense of maintaining these very old buildings was simply more than a small, independent organization like ours could manage. We had to choose between serving the buildings and serving our clients, and so we made the agonizing decision to sell. But then, a miracle happened. So these buildings are not being sold. Yeah. These buildings are staying in the community. So Hartley House will become a combination of community services, so social services, and affordable housing. As borough president, I unfortunately see other nonprofits who do not come together as Hartley has with Joe Sitz here, with the community board, the speaker, elected officials, and with Hudson Gill. And I hope that other nonprofits in the city look to this and say, we need to do the same thing. So congratulations. Today's a really good day because we are saving Hartley House, which you know is so important for young people and for people of all ages. So today the community came together to save this amazing organization. It's been here since 1897 and we are so, so proud that we're able to keep this invaluable community resource in the community, helping House Kitchen for generations to come. So today's a good day. I'm so excited. I am super excited. It is such a blessing to be back in the community where I grew up, where I went to school, and my children came here and grew up here and attended programs. So it is such an honor, and I am excited to celebrate and be here for another 120 years. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm Noah Edgelin, reporting from New York, and I'm one with 25. What a heartwarming story, Noah. That is today's Eagle News, Washington, D.C. Join us tomorrow for stories that matter to you. Visit our websites at eaglenews.ph and eaglenewslive.com. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash eaglenewsph. Thank you for watching. I am Jennifer Polentan and I am one with 25. <laughs>